Okay, good morning, Westridge. How we doing? That was a little lame, Westridge. Expect a little more out of you guys. How we doing? Come on, give it a little shout. All right, woke you up a little bit. Hey, welcome in. We are so glad that you are here with us in the room, watching online. We are excited that you have come to worship with us today as a church and that we get the privilege of gathering together. And so we're going to kick off this service with one of the best ways that we know how, and that's by celebrating baptisms. So we've got kids and students that are taking this important step and uh, ready to let your, you as their church family know that they are followers of Jesus and that they're ready to live in obedience to who he's called them to be. And so that's what baptism is. That's what it uh, symbolizes. And so as you hear these stories, as you hear these testimonies, just give a hand, clap, shout, and uh, let's celebrate what God's doing in the lives of these kids and students. So, Callie, you ready? All right. I'm going to read yours first. So this is Callie Jackson and her small group leader, Destiny, who's doing a great job with her. And here's what her story says. She says, my parents pray with me before bed each night. We talk about God as a family. One night last summer, my mom was praying and thanking Jesus for loving her and our family being in her heart and saving her. And she prayed that one day I would also pray and ask God to ha ask to have God in my heart. While she was praying that, I realized that I did want to have Jesus in my heart too. So I prayed and told God that I wanted him to come live in my heart and that I believe he is God and that he died to save us from our sins and I wanted to live my life for him and with him. My life feels better knowing he's always with me and I feel held on by him and I can feel him guiding my life. It's awesome, Callie. All right, Leah, come on up here. This is Leah Leonard. She says, I was always raised in the church, but I had a shallow faith, knowledge, and understanding. I started to make decisions that were not right. Some events happened for a reason that I didn't understand, which involved the death of a special person. I went to her funeral, and a pastor was preaching on salvation and giving your life to Christ. I thought I was saved at the time because I had been saved before, but I quickly realized that I had not given my life to Christ on my own. I struggled really hard and fell into a depression that quickly led me down a road I would never go down again. Then I had some kind of a feeling that words cannot describe. I felt God's presence more than I ever have in my life, and that night I became a true follower of Jesus Christ. Really cool. Well, Callie, Leah, we are proud of you guys, excited to see what God's going to do with your life and how he's going to use you as you follow him. And so have you put your faith and trust in him as your Savior? All right, well, it is a privilege for us to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with him in death, and you are raised to walk in new life. Congratulations. All right, we got some brothers here. Come on over here, Brooks. All right, this is Brooks and Bryson Green. A couple years apart, best of friends, probably fight like, like brothers do, right? They're going to give me nothing. They're going to give me nothing. All right, so this is Brooks. He says, I've known Jesus loved me since before kindergarten. I grew up in church and learned about Jesus from my mom and dad. But recently, I lost a close friend and teammate, Malachi, from brain cancer. At his celebration of life service, Pastor Brent talked about how believing in Jesus and knowing he forgives us is how we can get to heaven. I have Jesus in my heart, and I, and I want to show his love by loving others the way that Jesus loves us. It's good stuff, Brooks. And then this is what Bryson says. He says, I've learned about Jesus ever since I was little. I remember hearing at Surge Camp, which is our, our sports and arts camp for kids, last year that Jesus was my Savior, and he would forgive me for my sins. And during church, my small group leader, Matthew, talked to us about how Jesus died on the cross for us. And by being kind to others will help me show God's love to everyone. Having Jesus in my life feels good, and I know that I will go to heaven. All right, fellas, I can't think of a better person to get baptized with than your brother. This is awesome. So, boys, have you put your faith and trust in Jesus as Savior? Yes, sir. 
All right, yeah, I like it. In tandem, come on. All right, well, it is a privilege for Brent and I to baptize you guys in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with him in death. You are raised to walk in new life. Come on. All right, Kieran, come on down here, buddy. We got one more. This is Kieran, a seventh grader. Here and more, he says, I had been thinking about my salvation decision for a while and had been reading my Bible every morning. Then one night I was lying in bed thinking about it and decided I wanted to accept the Lord as my Savior and take the next steps. I got out of bed and went into my parents' room and I asked my dad if he could help lead me in prayer. We went back to my room and prayed together where I asked Jesus to come into my heart as my Lord and Savior. After that, we went downstairs and told the rest of my family. They were all very happy for me, and I'm happy to take the next steps and be baptized. It's awesome. And Dad, kudos to you, man. Dad's back here. And, uh, man, I love when parents, moms, dads taking steps to help their, their kids and their students understand who God is and take really important steps in their faith. So, Karen, have you put your faith and trust in Jesus as Savior? Yes, sir. Awesome. What's well, a privilege for us today? to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with him in death. You are raised to walk in new life. Man, it is, it is such a privilege for Brent and I to be a part of our kids and students and family ministries just to see so many of your sons and daughters and kids just taking steps in their faith. And so, man, just what a, what a privilege, what an opportunity. And so, we invite you as the church to stand as we get ready to worship and just celebrate who Jesus is today. Amen, church. As we continue to celebrate, we have an incredible opportunity where we still have families here wanting to come in and worship with us. So if you want to move your way towards the center of the room, if there's any empty seats next to you, we want to make space for families to worship together. Guest services, the front right section, I'm seeing a good amount of space over here with Miss Kathy. But we're excited to be able to worship together. We want to respond to who he is, remind our souls that no matter what season we're facing, whatever mountain or giant we feel like we're in front of, in Jesus' name, we can say move, and it'll move. So let's celebrate that today. And I won't be 
you're great and greatly to be praised. You're bigger, you're better, you're stronger. We just acknowledge you this morning. We honor you this morning. We worship you this morning. church let's sing that right now full of faith when he shall come when he shall come with trumpet sound Oh! 
It's so good to be able to worship with you this morning, to lift the name of Jesus together. You guys can have a seat. We have some really exciting um, opportunities ahead of us as a church, and we'd love to share more with you about that right now. Family. It isn't merely a social construct. It is a man's idea. Family is and was God's idea from the beginning. It's his design for our good and his glory. But just like everything else that involves the human heart, sin fractured the family. Because of the fall, we find ourselves in a world where home isn't a safe place. In a country where over 400,000 children are in the foster care system, where the state of Georgia has 12,000 children in the foster care system, and over 500 of these children are living in hotels because there aren't enough foster homes to care for them. All throughout scripture, we see that Jesus cares deeply for the orphaned and the vulnerable. Let's care for who he cares for. Through the body of Christ, the church, families can be redeemed and restored. Imagine a world where the family of God loved children in the midst of brokenness and witnessed the redemption of a generation. Family, it's God's design for our good and his glory. It is time for us to stand in the gap for so many children right here in our own community who need a safe and loving home. It is time for us to be the father to the fatherless and to be the mother to the motherless. It's time for us to be the light of Christ to children in the foster care system. That's why I'm so excited to be partnering with Windshape Homes to develop an effective ministry here at Westridge Church that will serve vulnerable children all over our community. That's why I'm asking each of you to consider helping local children to receive Christ-centered care. And here are a few ways you can be a part of all of this. First, you can become a foster parent. Windshape Homes equips each family and provides the certification training you need to prepare to open your home. Or second, you can provide respite care for church members who are fostering. That means you're gonna care for a child overnight or for a few days. Or third, you can support foster families in practical ways through prayer and everyday acts of service. Listen, this is no easy task and it's gonna require all of us to participate in some way. But the good news is that Jesus set the standard for caring for children. So let's follow his lead because every child deserves to experience a safe and loving home. Church Church family, I hope that already as you're sitting here and you have just watched that video that God is already stirring in your heart. You're already making your heart beat for those things that his heart beats for, the vulnerable, the fatherless, the motherless. And God seems to be opening wide a gate for us to lock arms with windshape homes and come around foster kids in our community and care for the most vulnerable in our community. And it's our opportunity in this house, in this church, as a family, to say, yes, Lord, have your way. And we're going to do that. And I know you might be sitting there and you're watching that video. You kind of want to raise your hand and say, uh, Christy, you have more questions. And if you do, if you're in that spot, I have good news for you. Because we have a team from Windshape Homes that is here with us this week and the next two Sundays. They're in the atrium and they are full of knowledge. They'll ask you. They'll answer any of your questions. They have resources. And then also we want to encourage you, if you have a lot of questions, sign up for the informational meeting. You can do that at that desk out there where they are at, where they are answering all your questions. And that happens on February 26th here at Westridge during the 1245 service. And one thing I know, God is looking at Westridge Church and he has asked us to be faithful in much, in a lot. But he has counted us as faithful because he has brought this opportunity, this partnership with Windshape Homes, and it's big, and it is the heartbeat of our God. We see that in the scriptures, the way his heart beats for children 
for the fatherless, for the motherless. And so for us to remain faithful, not only in the doing, he has a lot for us to do. And I hope and pray that you're already attaching yourself to one of those three things that Pastor Brian shared in that video. Are one of those three things you? Do you already know that God's been working in the background, working on you? There's a lot in the doing, but there's also a lot in the giving. And so we need to remain faithful because we want God to keep asking Westridge Church to do things like this, to partner with Windshape Homes and come around the vulnerable. And so we give every Sunday at Westridge and there's a variety of ways to give. But when we give, we're saying, not our way, but your way, God. Not our will, but your will, God. And it takes a lot sometimes to trust with our money. And you may be very new in the giving and you're figuring out what that looks like for the first time to step forward. But we give when, and when we give, it's out of obedience also out of worship. We are worshiping a good God who has blessed us and everything he has given us is ultimately his, but we have an opportunity to, opportunity to give back to him. And so that's what we're doing. We're doing it in the doing, but we're also doing it in the giving. So right here in this moment, will you bow your heads with me and let's give this time to the Lord. God, we thank you that you have looked at Westridge Church and you have counted us as faithful. And so I'm asking for everyone in this room, for everyone joining us online, where this is their church home, God, would we be the most faithful in our giving? Would we be the most obedient? Would it be worshipful for us to give back to you so that we can keep saying yes? You keep bringing things to us, God. Let our yes be a resounding big yes and make known to us what our next step is. Is, is it one of those three things? Which one of those three things? God, already be working in the background. We give this time of giving to you, God, and we thank you for looking at us and counting us as faithful. In your name we pray, amen. Well, I want you all to stand with me. We're going to worship in one more song. And this last song is called, the last song is from Psalms 130, and it's called, I Will Wait For You. <laughs> I was going good there for a second. But I want to encourage you, even this week, to jump into that Psalms, because I know a lot of us are in the waiting. And we've heard our pastor, Pastor Brian, share about how he and Amy have had long seasons of waiting. And they have faithfully prayed, knowing that God hears them. He's in the background and he's doing something. And so let that be the anthem, not just of this moment, right here, right now, but of this season. We trust you, Lord, in the waiting. Let's worship together. darkest places I will call. Incline your ear to me, I'll reach. And hear my cry for mercy, Lord. Worry to count my sin.
that healing today. Let all who trust in him today find healing in his sacrifice. There's beauty in the waiting. I will wait for you. I will wait for you through the storm. you to go ahead and have a seat as we get ready to hear the teaching of his word. So good. Thank you guys for such great worship. And you know, one of the guys, one of the teams that I appreciate so much in this church is our production team, the guys who just brought these tables and chairs out here. And oftentimes they're back there and we got folks running soundboards back here and lights up here. And there's a whole team back there in a room that are running all the words on the screens and guys back here and ladies back here. And and would you just thank them just for all the hard work they do? And if you would like to be part of that team, there are some tremendous opportunities in, uh, right now in front of you. Um, and so uh, just you love to be behind the scenes. You're really good with technology. You like to work, you know, all kinds of electronical stuff that helps the church really run smoothly on Sunday mornings and through the rest of the week. There's some great opportunities for you to, uh, to be connected there. And so if you want to take your Get Connected card out in front of, uh, in the chair in front of you, just right on there, I want to be part of the production team, and someone's going to get in touch with you uh, in the next few weeks. Well, um, I always love these moments uh, when I get a chance to speak with my wife, Amy, and uh, wish uh, we could have come up with a little bit catchier title for this morning's uh, sermon, Parenting Issues, but honestly, that's the best we had. And, uh, but I will say this, Amy has, in the, during COVID, she wrote a book on raising boys and I've read this book three times and quite honestly, it, you could read this book if you have girls, there's so many transferable principles there, but it's called between ball games. We should have just called this morning between ball games, but anyways, um, so just a great book and it's out there in the atrium. It's available. If you want to grab a copy of this book, uh, it's out there at one of the tables out there. So my wife, Amy. All right. Good morning, Westridge. You guys look great today. Um, I'm glad that you're here, and we just want to welcome the people who are watching online. Um, last September, they started a brand new series in the book of Mark, and it's about the life of Jesus, and it's kind of verse by verse through the book of Mark, and I thought this 
this was gonna last like what a year, a year and a half. I thought this series is gonna oh, last forever. Ever. I, that's that's I don't know how I feel about that, but listen. This series on the book of Mark has been amazing. Do you agree? How many of you have just loved that? I have loved it. Um, Nobody raised their hands out here except for <laughs> that guy right there. <laughs> so last week, Brian kind of launched a, a family series called Family Issues out of the book of Mark. And so we're just super excited <laughs> to be with you today in that second, second week of the series, and this is on parenting, yes. parenting issues. So in the book of Psalms, chapter 127, uh, the writer of this psalm says something very good about parenting, and I want to start off this morning by reading this. Uh, they write, children are a heritage from the Lord, offspring a reward from him. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior are children born in one's youth. Blessed is the man, blessed is the woman whose quiver is full of them. Now, what's a quiver, right? Well, it's a bag that holds arrows, and your kids are like those arrows that fill that quiver that God hit, has, has given you. But the question is, what do you do when your quiver has issues? When you have little issues inside of your quiver? Because listen, I'm, and Amy and I can speak that from this from experience, nothing grabs your heartstrings more than when your kids are struggling. Mm -hmm. Nothing grabs your kids, your heart strings more or causes the tears to flow than when your kids are hurting or your kids are dealing with difficult people and you just want to beat somebody or maybe your kids have drifted away from God and you are having parenting issues. Well, I want to give you a word of encouragement that Amy and I got a few years ago from a counselor that we see from time to time, a guy named Chip Judd, who's actually spoken on stage here a few times. Um, but Chip said, he, gives, he said, listen, don't judge your parenting until your kids turn 35. And some of you are like, oh, my son's 33. I've got two more years to really, <laughs> you know, see if this is going to work out well. But, but, you know, that was such a great relief to, to not just us, but to everyone that he said that to. Because honest truth is, I mean, so many of us are dealing with issues relating to, to our parenting. And so many of you have kids who are really little and some who are out of your house and there are all these different seasons that go into parenting. And I want to talk, first of all, just about these seasons. Because every season of parenting presents its own set of challenges and opportunities. What are those four uh, seasons that we find ourselves in as parents? Well, uh, my friend Matt Wilmington, who used to be executive pastor here, used to talk about these seasons. And then I saw recently that Andy and Sandra Stanley, who just wrote a book on parenting, also talk about these very same seasons. And the first one is the discipline years. And it's the years of when your kids are zero to five years old. How many of you have kids who are zero to five years old right now? Lots of you, lots in the first service as well. Um, here are the three things that you need to be focused on during these years, the discipline years. Number one, disobedience. Number two, dishonesty and disrespect. I know a lot of times we try, and, and Amy and I probably made this mistake with our firstborn, Taylor, but it was like we were tackling every, every single thing. But if you can just focus on those three things, it's going to cover a multitude of things. Disobedience, dishonesty, and disrespect. I've heard this quite a bit over the last several years. We don't believe in discipline. I've heard young parents say that. Or we, or we don't want to punish our kids. And, and what often happens there is we, 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 we confuse discipline with, with the word punishment. Here's the truth, okay? Someone is going to discipline your kids. Okay? It can either be you... Or it can be a principal, or a coach, or a teacher, or a police officer, or a judge. Discipline needs to start early. It needs to be consistent. It needs to be immediate. Your goal when your kids are zero to five is obedience. And it's, and it's obedience quickly. I mean, you don't want to be bantering with your four-year-old about walking into traffic and going, I don't know if you should do that. No, you're like, stop now. And you want them to obey you immediately. Now, here's a, here's a couple of big no's when it comes to discipline, okay? Don't count. You say, what are you talking about? So this is one, all right, I'm going to give you to the count of three before something bad happens, all right? All right here's what you're doing. You're giving your kids the option of whether they're going to obey you or not. Just don't, just take the counting and throw it out. It doesn't work. Here's a second thing. Don't discipline out of anger, my worst parenting moments happen when I decided to power up over my boys. Amy and I have 
two, two young, uh, young adult sons. Taylor's almost 28. Zach's 24. Um, and they're both very strong guys. And oftentimes they would just get really angry. And sometimes it might have been at, with Amy. And I felt this need as a dad. I've got to match this intensity over here. I mean, these guys, I mean, they're giving her the business. I, I need to let them know who's in charge. When our youngest guy, Zach, was in middle school, we had to go to a counselor. We needed help, all right? Um, and I remember talking to this counselor about my parenting at that moment. And he was like, so, so when this happens, what do you do? And I'm like, I just, I match his intensity because I'm wanting to protect her. Or, you know, I want to show him, you know, who's in charge. And he looked at me in like a Dr. Phil moment. And he goes, how's that working out for you right now? <laughs> And I'm like, it's not. And here's what he told me. He said, listen, if you will do this, all right, this is what's going to work for you. Just stay calm, all right? Just stay calm and collected and just say, listen, if you do this, here's the consequences. And then once that happens, just be calm, be consistent, but be swift. Just do what you say you're going to do. And I remember, you know, going, but what if all of a sudden things get broken, things get, you know, explode? He goes, just let things be broken. Just let things, you know, whatever. I mean, Amy and I, we joke sometimes. We used to keep a drywall guy on, on, on speed dial sometimes. But our, our kids have actually turned out well, which we're really thankful for. And it's God's grace. But, but we had some strong-willed guys in our house. But I just learned to just calm down, be consistent, be calm, be swift. Here's the challenge when it comes to discipline. On one hand, some of you are afraid of being your parents because they were just way too heavy-handed. And on the other hand, some of you are afraid of your kids. Yes. Some of you are afraid of your tiny little kids or maybe even your teenagers, right? I remember when Taylor was two years old, two, he looked at me and he pointed his little finger at me and he said, you're not in charge, I'm in charge. I was like, oh no. And I think, I think he was, I think he was truly in charge. I remember times when I would call Brian when he was at work, and I'm like, I don't even know what to do. He said he's in charge, and I think he really is. Sometimes I was scared of my little kids, and sometimes when they become teenagers, then you really get scared of them, right? You're thinking, well, what if they don't like us? Well, what if they turn against God? What if I can't give them all the things to make them happy? But I love this verse, 2 Timothy 1.7. It says, God has not given us a spirit of fear. Has he but of love and of power and of self-discipline? And we have to remember, we don't have to be afraid of our kids, no matter what age they are, because God's going to give us everything that we need to raise them. And I remember a few of those phone calls, and I would say, Amy, you're the mom. You've got this. Yes. You're really in charge. You can do it. But listen, you can handle these discipline years. You can handle these zero to, four, to five years. God's given you everything that you need. So listen, parents who are, have kids this age, you've got this, Okay. Here's the second, the second stage, the training years, 5 to 12 years old. How many of you have kids 5 to 12 years old? Lots of you. Okay. You're training while you're explaining. You're giving your kids instruction, and you're explaining why, why it's important. Now, here's the goal during this season. You want to develop good habits during the season. Now, I want to talk to you. In, when you're in this season, it's 5 to 12 years old. Here's what you have in your hands, parents. Look at me. You have dials of influence. And there are moments where you have to look at what's happening in your kids' lives and you have to dial in some good influences and sometimes you have to dial out some bad influences. And you always have those dials in your hands and you have to constantly be assess, you know, assessing what's going on. Do, 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 we need, do we need a little bit more of this, a little bit more church, a little bit more great Christian friends? Do we need to dial this kid out? This kid's been spending way too much time. I see bad things. This kid's got to go. All right? This, 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 this. You know what this kid's watching or this too much video games. What We're going to dial this out a little bit. But you have to be very strategic and very purposeful. And you have to understand you're the one that has the dial in your hands. All right. I will give you a, a parenting tip. Over the years, um, Amy and I have prayed people in and out of our kids' lives. And I'm just going to give you permission. God, God, he's given you everything you need to parent. And sometimes you need to just go, you know what? I'm just going to pray this kid out of my kid's life. All right, I'm going to pray this kid in, or I'm going to pray, you know, I don't like this girl. She's got to go. We're going we're gonna to pray her out. And God, sometimes he answers those prayers, yes, he okay? Does. But God, sometimes we've got dials in our hands, and we've got the power of prayer, and sometimes we need to adjust those dials a little bit, and sometimes we just, not, not just sometimes, a lot of times we need just to go, to go to prayer and say, Lord, 
I just need to know how to use these influence dials right now. And sometimes I just need you to step in and help me with this situation. And then number three is the coaching years. That, those are the years between 12 to 18. How many of you have uh, kids in that age group? Okay, lots of you. You are connecting more than you are correcting. And your hope at this stage is, is that you want them now to come to you, to choose to come to you for guidance and support. How does that happen? There's no substitute for time. It's just time. You have to invest the time. You have to make time for time. I remember um, years ago when our boys, Zach was in middle school, Taylor was in high school. And uh, they were both playing sports. Zach, it was a fall season. Zach was playing football. Taylor was playing high school baseball. And my boys, when they were younger, our boys used to get in fights, physical fights. As a matter of fact, one of them happened right over there in the corner in the, here in the worship center. Um, this, they were much littler then. But um, I told them, based on that counselor's advice, okay, guys, here's the deal. If you get into a physical fight, the next time it happens, I'm going to call your coach, and I'm going to call your coach, and you're going to miss the next game. And they're like, what? Yeah, you're, you're going to miss the next game. So sure enough, I don't know how long after, a few weeks after, they got into a physical fight, and I said, okay, you're going to miss the next game. And I mean, we, we thought we were having, you know, meltdown moment in, in our house, but I called Zach's middle school football coach, and I said, Zach won't be there this week because a little physical altercation. And coach is like, what? Yep, he won't be there. And then I called Taylor's high school coach, and I said, here's what's happened. And, and I think I remember him going, that's pretty good parenting. Well, then I took them fishing. We left the house. I told them to pack their bags. They thought they were going to the detention center, but I actually took them fishing. <laughs> and... Um, we visited drove up. the detention center once with we Zach. We did visit I one time that. with Zach. We took, I literally sat out in front of the detention center. I said, took him on a tour. There's your future right there, pal. Um, <laughs> fortunately, he's a student pastor in Kansas City today. So um, he's going to be so upset you mentioned that. Sorry. That wasn't, that wasn't in the notes. I love that. But we're, so here we are fishing. Here we are fishing. We're on a dock at this lake up in Blue Ridge. And Zach looks at me and he goes, I got to be honest with you. I don't understand this kind of parenting. We get in a fight. You take away my football game. You take away his baseball game. And here we are, here we are fishing. What kind of parenting is this? And I said, Zach, I just realized you guys need more time with me. You two need to spend more quality time together. We're just going. We're, we're coming and going. We're running too fast. We need to slow things down. You guys need more time. He went, all right, good enough, Dad. All right, throwing it out there. So... The, then the fourth stage is the friendship years. And this is the stage that Amy and I are in right now. This is 18 years old and above. How many of you are in that stage right now? Okay. The, I'm going to be honest with you. We love this season. We really do. And I'm going to tell you two of the best pieces of advice we've been given during the season. And the first one comes from a book from a youth ministry guru that I used to follow back in the days during my student ministry years guy named Jim Burns, and he wrote a book called Doing Life with Your Adult Children, and the advice is just in the subtitle. It's a great book, but the advice is in the subtitle, and here it is. Keep your mouth shut and the welcome mat out, okay? I'm just telling you that works. Here's the second great piece of advice that we've been given during these um, young adult you know, uh, years that we're in right now. Instead of making statements, ask questions. Instead of making statements, ask questions. Now, I know some of you are thinking, yeah, but listen, I've got some advice and they need to hear it. How's that working for you? And you're thinking, yes, but I'm right and I'm watching them do things. Well, sometimes you need to put the relationship over being right. You're like, no, I'm right. Well, sometimes you, you can either be right or you can have a relationship. And oftentimes you can't have both. But if you focus on the relationship, sometimes they will give you an audience to share what you need to say. But just always ask questions, all right? So there's a lot of changes during these seasons, and hopefully you're, ch hopefully you're changing as a parent. Your kids are changing. Their friends are coming and going. You're cha they're changing schools. They're changing interests. They're going into college. And some of you are really losing it over college right now. I'm going to be honest with you. I went to four different colleges over four and a half years. I'm doing okay up here. I just want you to know that I survived all of that. So relax. You, you have spouses that are coming into the picture right now. We've just had our, our boys just got married, both of them in the last year and a few months. And God just blessed us with such great daughter-in-laws. You have grandkids coming into your life. Some of them are moving away from you. 
all right? So what is it that stays throughout all of these seasons? Here's one thing that stays, your goals in parenting. Here's one goal. You want them, even when they're one-year-old, two-year-old, here's what you need to think about. You want them to successfully leave your home one day, all right? You want them at 18 or so, you want them to go, all right? Now, I will tell you this. Sometimes they come back, but it's okay, all right? Because God will give you some of those sweet moments, but you want to raise them to leave the nest, not to stay with you. We had people to... cheering in the nine o'clock service about yeah, leaving. Like, yes, get out of our house, go. okay? Um, but you also, you, here's the second thing. You want them to choose to be with you and their siblings when they no longer have to, okay? It's such a great goal. At Thanksgiving, you don't have to shame them to come back home. You want them to go, hey, we're coming back home and we're bringing the kids with us, all right? Here's the target through every season of your parenting. And this is where my parents and Amy's parents just hit the bull up, the bullseye. It's all about the relationship. Think about what God the Father wants from us. He wants a relationship. Jesus says this in John 17, 3. He says, this is eternal life that they may know you. They may know you, God, the only true God and the one who have sent you, Jesus Christ. In other words, God wants to know us. He, he wants to have a relationship with us. And not just now, but throughout all of eternity. The whole story of the Bible is a love story between God and his people. He yearns for us. He cares for us. He has a tender heart for us. So your goals in parenting do not, they don't change. They stay the same with each season. And here's a thing, another thing that does not, that, that stays during the season. Yeah, so there are four things that we decided we wanted our boys to know about God. And these were things that weren't things that we wanted them to do or things that we wanted them to be. But instead, we thought if we can anchor them in these truths about God, then it's going to sustain them through their difficult moments. And our kids are going to have difficult times, aren't they? We don't want to think about it, but they will. So what's going to sustain them when we're not around and they're going through heartaches or difficulties? So we decided if, if they can really get these four things about God, then it's going to help them in their difficulties. So the first one is that God loves you unconditionally. God loves you so simple. These are truths that we can instill through their whole life, no matter how old they are, whether they're one or two, or if they're 50 or 60, we're going to still be weaving these truths into the lives of our boys. God loves you unconditionally. And what better verse than John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. That's probably a verse you learned when you were really little. But I love that because it just reminds us that that it's not works or good deeds that would get us to heaven, right? But what Jesus has done and that it's enough. His love for us was so great that he came to be our savior and get us all the way to heaven. And the second one is that you can trust him completely. You can teach your kids. You can, whoa, you can trust God completely. He has a hundred percent track record, right? And people will let you down. Even your parents might let you down. We don't want to, but we're human. But God will never, ever, ever let you down. He will always keep his promises to you. Mm, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 tells us that we can trust in the Lord with all our hearts and not to lean on our own smarts like our own understanding. But if we acknowledge him in all our ways, he will make our path straight. And then the third one is he will never leave you. And I love this verse, Hebrews 13, 5, for God has said, I will never fail you. I will never abandon you. Some of your kids are going to experience some bit of abandonment, people leaving them, turning their back on them, but God will never, ever do that. And then the fourth one is that everything that you need is in Christ. Everything you need, no matter how old you are, no matter what you go through in life, you've got everything you need because you have Jesus, right? Mm -hmm. Colossians 2, 9, and 10 says this, for in Christ lives all the fullness of God in a human body. So you are complete through your union with Christ, who's the head over every ruler and authority. And when our kids know those truths, no matter what they go through, no matter how old they are, those truths can anchor them deeply in God's word and get them through all of those difficult times. So that was all number one. And now we're going to move to number two. Are you ready? 
Number two is help your kids develop a firsthand faith. What does that mean? It means helping God be their God. And so how do we do that exactly? So here's a few thoughts. First of all, use their challenges to point them to Jesus. Whatever their challenges may look like at the time, if they're a little kid, it might be a skin knee, right? If they're in middle school, it could be the mean girls that they're dealing with. Or maybe it's college applications and big decisions that they're having to make as they get older. But we say to them, let's ask God about this. Let's take this to God and ask him to work this out for us, okay? And then when he does, we talk about it. You say, see, God worked that out for us. We prayed and he worked it out, didn't he? So don't always rescue your kids. Now, there are times when we need to rescue our kids, right, from um, evil, from danger. But we have to pray as parents and ask God for wisdom because we can't come in and rescue them all the time. And what I mean by rescue is I mean like running to the rescue and shooting off wacko emails and telling every mean teacher off and, you know, calling all those parents and putting stuff on Facebook or even just trying to um, fix all of their problems because your kids need to get a story. Okay? You have to let them get their own story about God, a story where God comes in and rescues them, whether they're five or 55, where God rescues them and then they know it and they say, God rescued me. And he builds a story in their life. So, so you want your kids not to have grandma's faith, although that's a wonderful thing. You don't want them to have your faith, um, although that's a wonderful thing. They have to have their own faith. Right? And it's our job, our honor, and our responsibility as parents to point them to Jesus in every way. Um, I want to encourage you to put God's reputation on the line. Okay? Put God's reputation on the line. Even now, I will say to my boys, God has got this. He is faithful. We can, we can come to him and know that he's going to work things out. He's, he's true. He keeps his promises. He's going to do this. And then I go in the back room and go, oh, God, please do this. Please do this. I told him that you're going to do this, and this is your reputation on the line. This is your name that's at stake here. And I think God wants us to do that, right? It's scary as a parent to do that, no matter how old they are. But when we can take their problems and we can point them to Jesus, and then we can point out, see, he came through, he came through again, and he will come through. For your kids, it's probably not going to look like what we want it to look like. It's not going to be in the timing that we want him to come through. Like, okay, God, any day now, waiting. you can come through. But we're in the waiting. We're trusting him. Mm -hmm. And then, if you want your kids to develop a firsthand faith, you have to live your life as a fully devoted follower Amen. of Jesus, Amen. right? If we're asking them to develop a faith in God, they have to look at us and know we're the real deal, right? You can't be coming to church and then acting crazy the rest of the week. Your kids need to see you in God's word, trusting him through the difficult times and the waiting and praying like you've never, ever prayed before because when you're walking with him, it's contagious, isn't it? It's mm. contagious, and your kids are going to catch that. Mm, that's so good. So good. Number three, don't let culture dictate your parenting. Mm. There is mm. so much going on in culture today that is pulling at us, that is trying to shape and mold how we're parenting our kids, and we have to make a decision. We're not going to let that happen. There are going to be some things that are going to govern and guide our parenting. And so one of the things you have to do is you have to draw some boundaries around your family. And one of the things I want to encourage all of you to do and is to be present in your home with your spouse and your children. What does that look like? When you're at home, put your phone down. All right? So much of this, we, we run into this so much when we're counseling other couples or this and that, is, is this complaint when I'm trying to talk to my husband and he, his, huh? Huh? Put your phone down. Put your computer away. Put your electronic devices away. Be present. Be present. When you are home and you're not working, whether you're the husband or the, or the wife, be as present as you can possibly be. Here's the second thing. Put limits on outside of activities. Um, when Taylor was about 10 years old, all of a sudden we started noticing 
travel baseball became a thing. And then everybody started traveling, doing everything. Travel ping pong, travel crochet. I mean, I mean, travel knitting. I mean, it was all, it's a racket. All right, listen, we did some travel stuff. All right, but we did the very best thing we, we could do to put some boundaries. And what we're watching today is people are sacrificing their kids' faith on the altar of travel sports. And we have to put some boundaries around this. We have to say, here's, we're, we, if we're going to do this, here's how much money we're going to spend. Here's how much time. We're, we're not going to sacrifice our kids spiritually to do this. If, listen, if your kids are good enough, they'll, they'll make it. If they want to work hard enough, they'll get as far as they can go. But don't sacrifice your kids' spiritual lives on the altar of travel, all this stuff that's going on. And here's the third thing. Own your kids' spiritual formation. Own it. Take responsibility for it. Make a decision. Here's, here are the things, as Amy said, here are the four things or the five things we want our kids to know. Here are the anchors about God that we want them to know. Here's the places that we're going to put them in. We're going to dial some activities in into their life, just being in church, being in student group, being in kids ministry, because it's so important. And then when things go off the rails or your kids struggle, don't point fingers and blame everyone else. Don't blame your school. Don't blame your, your church. Take responsibility, even if, 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 if you struggle. Because here's the deal. Your kids are going to struggle. They're going to make some bad decisions. They may embarrass you at times. But you dig in and you trust God and you go, hey, we're going to make some adjustments here. But you own, you own your kids' spiritual formation. And you, husband and wife, husband and wife, you come together on this. Some of you are single parents. God's given you everything that you need if you have your kids in your home with you. He's going to make up the gaps. But you own that spiritual formation. All right, and, and take responsibility for it and say, God, here, I'm going to do the very best I can here, the things that I'm hoping that, we'll, that we're going to see happen. And God, you're going to take care of all of this. So there's some good things. But here's the thing. Don't let culture dictate your parenting. You take responsibility and trust God through every season. And then number four. Okay, number four is let prayer be the thread that runs through every season of your parenting. Let prayer be... The one thing that runs through every season. And um, Brian and I were on a FaceTime with our son, Zach, and his wife, Kelly, who live in Missouri. And it was so cool just to sit back and watch this as parents. But they said, we want you to see our prayer board. So in their kitchen, they made this board. And they have these little pieces of paper that they have tacked onto the board. And when these this column is their prayer request and then when the prayer is answered they take the paper and they move it into the next column of answered prayers and they were showing us look we prayed for this and we get to move it over to the answer column and we we're like yes like that's what you want as a parent right just saying thank you god thank you god for that but i just want to encourage you to pray big prayers um sometimes we think that God just wants us to come to him for the important things, but he wants us to come to him with all of the things, doesn't mean. Sometimes we think, okay, God, well, okay, I'm just going to ask you this one thing. That's it. Just do this one thing. And he says, no, come to me with all of the things because he delights in you and he's just crazy about your kids. Like he wants to bless them, but this is his plan. He says, you pray and I'll answer. You pray and I'll answer. And that's the plan. Like, that's it. So if we don't pray, how can we expect him to answer, right? So I want to read you this quick quote from this book that I love, Draw the Circle by Mark Batterson. This is what he says. God won't answer 100% of the prayers we don't pray. Why do we mistakenly think that God's offended by our prayers for the impossible? It's the impossible prayers that honor God because they reveal our faith and allow God to reveal his glory, right? So I want to encourage you today, pray huge prayers for your kids. Pray specific prayers. How will we know if God ever answered if we don't pray specifically? And I want to encourage you with this. You may be sitting here thinking, well, this would have been really nice for me to hear 20 years ago. I messed up. My kids are messed up. You know what? God is the master of taking the scraps and the messes and all of our mistakes and all of your mistakes. And he can take that and make something beautiful out of it, can't he? Maybe your kids are 40 years old. It's okay. You keep praying those big prayers for them because God thanks every prayer. He doesn't waste one of them. And you have been praying possibly for years 
prayers and years for the same thing. You just know that your prayers matter. They matter and your kids matter to God. So let me just ask you as we're closing here, um, what would be your next step? Maybe you aren't a parent here, and you've just been listening to this thinking, well, this message really isn't for me, but um, the truths that we want to anchor our kids in, those are the truths we want to anchor our own lives in, right? How much God loves us, and he'll never leave us, and how much um, we can trust him, and everything that we need is in Christ. So for you today, maybe you just want to say, God, what's my next step? Maybe that's praying a little more praying a little more specifically and just know that God, God is the master of taking all of our messes and making something beautiful out of them. Yeah, I want to ask you to bow your head for just a moment. I love what Amy just said um, because there are a lot of people in here who are struggling right now and I want you to know God can redeem your parenting. God can redeem your parenting. There are so many things that Amy and I look back over the last almost 28 years of parenting, and we go, oh, if we could just do that over. And yet, we have watched God step into those moments and redeem those stories and take moments of our own messiness and fix them. And so much of that, honestly, has been brought because we just prayed together, cried together, and asked God to intervene. And so many, many times he did. And there's things, honestly, that we're still waiting on God to move moments there's things that we're still praying for for family members even outside of our own uh, two boys and their wives that we're asking God to move to redeem and some of you are in that season right now I want to tell you a, a game changer moment for me as a 10 year old boy with head still bowed it was the moment that my dad put his faith and trust in Jesus I would I would not be up here today had he not made that decision where he became a follower of Jesus and that changed everything it changed not only his marriage but it changed his parenting and it gave me something to look at. It gave me a picture of, of the man that I wanted to become, the follower of Jesus that I wanted to become. And I, looked at, I look at that today and I went, God redeemed a story right there and gave two little boys and then eventually another little boy that my parents adopted a picture of what a fully devoted follower of Jesus can be. And men, you can be that. Ladies, you can be that for your children. But for some of you here today, maybe you have never made that decision to put your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ alone. You've never received God's gift of salvation into your life. And I want to give you an opportunity to do that as we close off our service today. If you've never put your faith in Jesus, you've never asked him for forgiveness of sin, you've never come to him with a humble heart and asked God to reconcile what's broken between you and him. And this is your moment to say, Lord, at this very moment, I put all my faith and all my trust in you. I come to you and ask you to forgive me of sin. Lord, I repent. In other words, I changed my mind about where I was going and I put all of my trust now in Jesus. And what he did for me on the cross was enough to pay for all of my sins and to reconcile what was broken and separated between me and you. And so today with my lips, I confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and I put all of my faith in him alone and what he's done for me on the cross. I want to know that I'm part of your family, God. So if you're praying with me right now, I want you to take the Get Connected card out of the uh, seat pocket in front of you. I want you to fill it out, and I want you to uh, check the box that says, Today I prayed to receive Jesus Christ as my, my personal Savior. And I want you to put it in the bucket on the way out or take it to the help center on the way out because we want to help you to take your next step as a follower of Jesus Christ. But for some of you, the rest of you, and you may just want to just take a moment and say, Lord, would you redeem some things here? Maybe I've realized that, that there are some things in my parenting that need to change, that need to be tweaked, that need to be adjusted. I'm in a season right now, and I need to shift a little bit with the season, and so, Lord, would you redeem this? Some of you have kids who are away from God right now. I love the story where Jesus tells a story about leaving the 99 to go after the one. And I can't tell you how many times, even in our prayer time, Amy and I, as we're praying for people in our lives, we're asking God, Lord, Please don't stop chasing them. Don't leave them alone until they come back to you. And for some of you, that's your son or daughter. God is not going to be, he's not going to leave them alone. He loves them that much. He's leaving the 99 to go chase them down. That's our prayer. And we're going to join you in praying that way. Father, would you help us all as we raise these little ones, as we influence these 
bigger ones that are in our lives, Lord, may we continue to trust you, knowing that you have given us everything that we need. If you've entrusted with, entrusted us with them, Lord, you're going to give us everything that we need during whatever season we're in. And we're thankful for that promise. We're thankful for Jesus today. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen, church. Can we just thank Pastor Brian and Amy for sharing that word and encouragement? I know a lot of, a lot of you, this just strikes a chord. You're just so personal. And I'm so thankful to be led by them because they're so lockstep and unified. And they've been through this. And to look at God's word and say, this is how we can be praying for our kids. This is how we can be praying for the next generation. One of the things that I feel like just keeps coming up over and over again, and we have to always remind ourselves. Jesus' disciples needed to be reminded or even taught what this actual prayer life looked like to intercede on behalf of others, to come to the Father and ask. And that keeps coming up as a theme, as prayer. And not just for the sake of an event. You hear us talk about the first Monday of every month, our night of prayer. And it's not just another reason to fill your calendar or to ask you to just come here. But we truly believe in the power of when a body of Christ comes together and unified, we agree and we declare something together. There's something powerful about in this room, we're sharing about parenting. And to know that everybody across this room is praying over that, depending on what season you're in. Maybe it's an anticipation. Maybe it's a season you're in the middle of. But we're all unified in doing that. And that as a body of Christ, we believe in the power of that unity and that agreement. So the purpose of this once a month is for corporate prayer. We're going to come together and we're going to believe some powerful things. We're going to ask God to move in mighty ways. Maybe it's just an extension of what we talked about this morning. I know for the 21 days of prayer that we're in, that's going to line up with our student ministry, the next generation, of what God's doing in this community. We're going to be praying towards that. Pastor Brian led our staff through a way that we can use scripture to pray. And I know that's what we're going to be doing together tomorrow night. So we want to invite you to come join us tomorrow night at 7 p.m. so that we can continue to be unified in prayer. I've been encouraged by today. I have uh, several kids that follow that spectrum that they spoke on, but to look at God's word and just hear the wisdom. I've been encouraged. Pray you were encouraged today. But we look forward to worshiping with you again next week. We love you, church. Have a great Sunday.